This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. We got a few more patrons I wanted to thank. Heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Andrew Baria, he's up at the Tamerlan level. And Gary Barnick, also up at the Tamerlan level. Yeah, guys, you're starting to make us regret like setting a cap because you just keep <laughs> whatever we set the highest. Like people just up. Well, I mean, we've only done it once, but right, we should yeah. do it again. Which, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems to be working for us. So, <laughs> so keep it up. <laughs> what, what do you guys want for a hundred bucks? Seriously, <laughs> or fifty bucks? Or like, give me some ideas. I don't really know. Uh... For a hundred bucks, I will go on a date with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> Just you, or do they, should we make them like pick? What, what do you think? Do we? They can date us like a couple. Or okay. We'll be like a poly couple. Oh, yeah. that's, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Jessica won't mind. Yeah. You guys are just so generous out there. So thank you. Uh, Matthias Rubinson also gave a $3. He's a, yes. He's an eye to die. So way to go. Thank you, Matthias. Matthias. Am I getting that right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, unless I got it wrong. <laughs> Again, really cool. We keep being surprised. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just especially surprised at how many people are donating at like the higher levels. Mm-hmm. Like when we originally came up with this, we were thinking like, I don't know, what should the the lowest level should be like a quarter or something, you know, <laughs> like try to encourage people to give, you know, something. Right, right. <laughs> but people are enthusiastic. They really it's are. Awesome. We've gotten like one donation at the lowest level. And like a bunch at the highest. And then I will get into corrections. I got to get some like intro music to corrections. Should like, we got like segue music? <laughs> sure. Like wah, wah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Starting off, we were trying to figure out why Moraine thought that Tom would be fine. Turns out Min may have told her. Tom would be fine as far as... I don't remember. Yeah. We, in, in, remember in the last episode, Tom disappeared and we we're like oh we won't see him again and yeah we we're like oh but moraine knows that he's coming back and we speculated a little bit on how she knows whether it was through the doorway or when she took her accepted test or when she went to ruidium mm-hmm. and so we were trying to figure out like how she knew and uh someone pointed out that she's been talking to min yeah min knows when people are going to get married or die yeah, I think Min is the one who tells her, hey, you're going to marry this guy, you know, with a, with a mustache or something. I see a mustache in your future. Who knows? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think at that point, Moraine knows that since they are definitely going to marry, they're both kind of safe until that happens. Yeah, since they're not married yet. Since they're not married yet. And Min always gets things right. Interesting. Yeah, that's probably, that's the best explanation. Yeah, I think that that's a pretty good theory. I don't think we get actually get very much out of Moraine about what exactly she hears. I wasn't able to find any definitive evidence of that. Someone pointed out a great theory that I had actually read before, but I had forgotten about. And it looks like this was put together by uh, G Minter one on uh, Reddit. What's up, G? <laughs> Brian JFK was quoting him and pointed it out to me because it's an older theory. But they were talking about Matt's luck. Okay. And if you remember when the Black Aja flee the White Tower a little bit later, uh-huh. um, they take a bunch of Terangriel with them. Right. Lanfear shows up in Matt's room right after he's healed. Oh, I forgot about that. And there is some evidence that she may have used that, that spotted dice Terangriel. Do you remember that one? No, I don't. So it was in the list of items that were stolen. What? What? Okay, yeah. So here it is. <laughs> it's a spotted dice to Angriol. It was in the list of items that were stolen. So it very well could have gotten to Lanfear. And then she shows up in Matt's room. He gets this tingling sensation. She's interrupted. So there's some speculation that what she was somehow using the spotted dice to Angriol to sort of alter chance to make him do what she wanted. Oh. And that somehow by interrupting it, that got transferred to him permanently. Now, I really like this theory, right? Because it's a cool idea that there's some source that this Terangrial somehow caused the luckiness. Yeah. 
um, and the timing's right. But we never see this Terra Angriol again. It never resurfaces. Lanfear never uses it again. We never even hear about it again other than it's in the list. We don't even know that Lanfear is using it for sure. Yeah. So I like this theory. I just can't find any real evidence for it. Yeah, that's too bad because, you know, we just don't know anything about it. The, I mean, the first thing that popped into my head was, would something like that still work if he's wearing the Foxhead medallion? Like if you, but yeah, I mean, why not? Because you can do do something to a person like, say, make someone forget a memory or something like that and then put the Foxhead on them and it shouldn't shouldn't stop anything that already happened only things that will or are or are happening right exactly now. it doesn't stop the effects of channeling it just stops the channeling itself right yeah i mean I could, I could see how that would persist if it got sort of embedded into his flesh how that would that luckiness would hang around i like that theory better than what we came up with <laughs> yeah it's a good theory i just i just wish there was some that the dice Terangriol came up ever again or ever appeared somewhere again. Yeah. You know, I, I, I looked them up and they're, it's literally never oh, mentioned after I mean, that chapter. It has to be. It's in the shape of a, a six sided die mm-hmm. and everything. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Anyway, and it, and they say uh, it was one of the Terangriol studied by Karen Nadil, uh, uh, yeah, the dreamer. I, yeah. Um, the dreamer, the last dreamer who studied all, all the Terra Angriol. So it may have just been picked up because she was the one of the ones, she was studying it and they were looking for a dream Terra Angriol. So that I think is really maybe the mo- the explanation for it is it just they were just picking up Terra Angriol she had studied. But... I mean, knowing the Wheel of Time, it just does, that's way too coincidental for it to mean be totally meaningless. Yeah. It's possible, but probably not. Right. Almost so, nothing is totally meaningless. Almost nothing. So I really like that theory. Oh, and then one last correction. I was talking about Mogedian as being captured in the circus. Mm-hmm. She wasn't captured until they got back to Salidar. Okay. I only sort yeah. of vaguely remember. So they, they, they figured out she was in Salidar with them, not that she was in the circus with them, which is what I was saying last time. Salidara. Is that what they call it? Uh, well, that's the blue sister who yeah, they yeah, use it's... as a code, and then Salidar is the name of the city. But that's it for corrections. Wow, that's surprising. <laughs> Done already? <laughs> just the three. Uh, and I think just one episode. Now that we've gotten through Patreon and corrections, we should get to the meat and start talking about the books. So we're doing which chapter? 28? Yeah, starting with chapter 28 today. It's called Footprints in Air, and the symbol is the staff and the leaf. It's a naive chapter. Yeah, I think of it more as a moraine chapter, yeah. honestly. Well, uh, I mean, it's from Nynaeve's point of view, isn't it? But it's really describing how Moraine is tracking the boys. Uh, yeah, there's a good amount of cool stuff. This is this is sort of a short chapter. I think it's only like um, six or seven pages. Yeah, it's super short. But uh, it's a good one. Um, I like the interaction between the three of them here. Yeah. Sort of it's like you really flavor. tense. <laughs> it's very tense. <laughs> and we start off the chapter with... Nynaeve, Lan, and Moraine coming to view of Whitebridge. Nynaeve has the thought that she's looking at a legend and Lan and Moraine don't even notice it. Like, they don't even look at it. Yeah. Well, they've crossed it a bunch of times. Yeah. It reminds me of this thing in... People say in New York City, I grew up in the area, that like if people... If you walk by someone in Manhattan and they're looking up, they're not from there. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) There's people who are impressed by how huge the buildings are. Yeah. You just get used to it if you live there for a while. Yeah. It's just like uh, trees or something. Just that that's their walls. Yeah. Like that you don't really notice the walls around you. Um, I'm curious. How do you think they got across the river? I don't know. I don't either. It doesn't say because they were on the other side of the river. That's where they met up. And now they are... There across the Arnon. Yeah, I have no idea. Because <laughs> everybody else swam across or took, a, you know, the, the boys took the boat down the river. Mm-hmm. And they just have their horses. Aguin and Perrin swam. But these three appear to have just teleported across. Well, they can't do that yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. think there is a bridge other than White Bridge. Right. Well, maybe they go all the way down the... That's what they're doing. They could and just walk across it. They spent the entire time... They haven't crossed the river. They just spent the entire time on the near side of the river. Oh, I, I mean, walk across White Bridge. Yeah, and then walk across the White Bridge. 
I mean, it, yeah, of course. That makes sense. Mm. Yeah, so they, they never crossed the river. Interesting, though, because I thought they would want to to put the river between the Trollocs and the Fades and them. You'd think, but I guess, the, you know, there's also the, like, the Fade and Trollocs don't care about Nynaeve effect that we saw a few chapters back. That's true, and they don't. They have no reason to care about uh, Lan or Moraine either. Yeah, they're busy. Well, we know the Mirror Draws already and has been in Whitebridge because Nynaeve, Land, and Moraine are arriving. I think this is like the day after. Was it the last chapter where Tom tackles yes. the Mirror Draw? Yes. And as soon as they walk in here, Moraine mentions it that she, she was like, they were here yeah. recently. And I, I think that this is the next afternoon. Agreed. It doesn't say specifically, but I imagine it's the next afternoon. They're, I think they're only a day behind. Yeah. It makes sense. You get down the river a little bit faster if you are on a boat. Yeah. Yeah. They've been moving really quickly if they kept up with the boat. I, you know, I don't think they were going all that far. I think there's a bit of a frustrating conversation with Moraine. And traveling, just traveling with Lan and, and talking with Moraine must be just super frustrating for Nynaeve. Yeah, we see this constant back and forth. And um, it's the next thing that I have is a conversation between the two of them where Nynaeve is saying, and then what do you do to plan when you found them? She, I said I. She, and she's talking about, you know, Ran, Matt, Aguin. She did not not for a minute believe the I said I would be so intent on finding them if she do, did not have plans. Tarvalin, wisdom. Tarvalin, Tarvalin, that's all you ever say. And I am becoming part of the training you will receive in Tarvalin, wisdom, will teach you to control your temper. You can do nothing with with the one power when emotion rules your mind. Nynaeve opened her mouth, but the eyes said I went right on. Lan, I must speak with you a moment. It just cuts her off. Well, and I like how the, the foreshadowing of you'll learn to control your anger in Tarvalin when really it learnt, teaches her to like bring her anger out all the time. Oh, I noticed that. Nynaeve has, doesn't at this point intend on training in Tarvalin, but Moraine doesn't say if you decide to train in Tarvalin. She says part of the training you will receive in Tarvalin. I think she knows that she can get Nynaeve all the way to Tarvalin, and the I said I other I said I won't let Nynaeve leave Tarvalin once she gets there. Moraine won't either. No, no, Moraine's not letting go of her. She's way too powerful yeah. to let her go. I'm sure also that that's the reason they even bother with Nynaeve. She's a jerk. She's <laughs> totally hard to handle. She's <laughs> she's like really difficult to work with if she's not in control of everything. Uh, but they spend like they devote all this time. Full trained Aes Sedai devote all this time to trying to break Nynaeve later of her uh, block. Oh, yeah. I mean, she's so powerful. Like It's worth it. Yeah. And and they would do that for any... Uh, I don't know if you can hear Timber in the background. <laughs> it's like rolling around <laughs> and making weird noises in the background. Uh, um, <laughs> but they do that for any Wilder. Yeah, that's true. They talk about how Theron... Uh, that's not the right name. No. She's the Aes Sedai who's... Uh, who tries to break Nynaeve. I think there's like a rotation. Don't uh, Aren't there a few different Aes Sedai that all there try are, different things? But there's one who's particularly good at it and who gets uh, a few more cracks at Nynaeve. Uh, and it's like one of the reasons she ends up running away from the White Tower a couple of times is like to get away from all the Aes Sedai trying to break her block. She's like, I can't, I can't do it. Not another day of getting like, she like isn't allowed to sleep and then gets drunk and then like oh, yeah. gets punched in surprise to see if like that'll work or, you know, I mean, she's <laughs> Just, they make her like stand on one foot and recite the oh, alphabet totally. backwards or they something. They make her ridiculous. completely miserable. Yeah, just to try absolutely everything. Little did they know, you have to just all you have to do is kill her. Yeah, no, just, <laughs> just hold her underwater till she dies. She's yeah, fine. <laughs> she'll be fine. Oh, I, I was going to say, I guess really any channeler is so rare that they're not going to let them go. It doesn't matter if they can even channel a little, but Nynaeve is particularly uh, valuable. And don't forget. Uh, Moraine knows she's connected to Rand through men's viewings. She's connected to whatever it is. Yeah. So she's not, she's no fool. She knows that she's not heading back to the village. Nynaeve is really important. Yeah. I mean, if anything, she cleanses the source and rallies all those extra borderlanders. Oh, yeah. I mean, she's incredible. It makes, makes a huge difference. I mean, it keeps Rand alive many, many times. And like all the male channelers. Yeah. He couldn't have done it without her. No. I mean, even at the end when she saves Alana from oh, dying, yeah. like no other Aes Sedai would have been able to save her because no one else would have had the herbs and the medical knowledge. So it's not just her power, it's her knowledge too. Oh yeah, I was just rereading this and I should probably remember, but isn't doesn't she not fight in the last battle? She just 
spends the whole time. Her and Moraine and Rand are linked together. Oh, in um, in the cave. So no, I mean she's not out on the battlefield fighting. She's just being a battery for Rand. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's sort of a. But she, you know, her and Moraine sort of come up with the plan to. Well, I don't know. I think Min comes up with the plan, but they seize um, Morden. So that, yeah. So that Rand has control over all of them. So they seize Morden and then pass control of the the link to Rand. So he has control over the two girls, Morden, Kalendor, and obviously whatever. The world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and and then Moraine's got that uh, Angriol in the mix too. On her wrist. Oh yeah. She gets that one from the uh, Eelfin. Oh yeah. Hmm. It's one of her wishes. I was gonna say, doesn't she? Oh okay. Well, anyway. Uh, the next thing I have is like the next paragraph, and I just underlined, if only there was some way to get rid of the woman, Nynaeve is talking about Moraine, or thinking about Moraine, Lynn would be better by himself. A warder would be able to handle what was needed, she told herself hastily, feeling a sudden flush. No other reason. <laughs> She's like, yeah. It's just funny because I never saw this, really, but... Uh, you don't you don't really notice it until you get all the way through the book, but even this early, I mean, we've had this conversation before. Uh-huh. That sudden flush is because she really, She's really like so into Lan. Lan, already. Lan. I was gonna say <laughs> no, no other reason except he's really hot. <laughs> yeah, I wrote down she's trying to impress Lan this whole time, and it drives her nuts that she's not getting his like approval. That it's not working. Yeah, well, sort of. I mean, it is working. She just doesn't see it. Yeah, yeah. She just they they just mount the tension for the next two years. <laughs> <laughs> well, next year they get they get together. I think they're married inside a year. Are they? Year and a half, maybe. But you know, Lan's mostly gone during the day. So during the day, it's just Moraine and Nynaeve together on the road. Bummer. I'm yeah. <laughs> that must be the most uncomfortable at this point. Nynaeve hates her. She's only doing this to get revenge. Yeah. And she's riding next to the person she wants to get revenge on. Sometimes, against her will, Nynaeve had found herself wondering what a wisdom could do with the one power of what she could do. Quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, quite a bit. And then I just have a bunch of stuff underlined that highlights the feelings I've been talking about over the last couple episodes that Elias, Moraine, Lan... The Eye of the Dark One, basically. Yeah, she explains it. Um, Yeah, go ahead and read that, because we've been talking about that a lot. And here it has, Land watched the forest and the river as if the leafless trees and wide, slow water carried signs of traps and ambushes waiting ahead. And we see Elias like being super paranoid like that. And even Moraine feels it. Nynaeve has the thought that she sort of wants to listen to the wind to see what this is about. But she knows now that it has to do with the one power and she um, she feels weird about it. So she doesn't. And I have Moraine saying here, it is the dark one, Nynaeve. The storm has left us, for a time at least. She raised a hand as though feeling the air, then scrubbed it on her dress unconsciously, as if she had touched filth. But he is still watching. She sighed. And his gaze is stronger. Not on us, but on the world. How much longer before he is strong enough to... Nynaeve hunched her shoulders. Suddenly she could almost feel someone staring at her back. And I think that's what this unease everyone is feeling is as the seals weaken and break, the Dark One is able to touch... And this storm, I think, is often that's referred to is really the dark one that she's always yeah. feeling when she's reading the wind. It's like it's violence and, and death and anger and panic, but it really is just the dark one getting closer and closer and closer to the world. And she's definitely right. I mean, Moraine's always right, but we see all the channelers, the only or both the warders and the wolf brothers. Of course, Elias is both those last two things, but right. they're all feeling it. Um, and then they arrive at Whitebridge to a pile of burnt rubble. Yeah, I was going to say, they see the after effects of the fire. Well, I shouldn't describe it as a pile of... It looks like um, there's there's just been some damage. They basically burn the inn that Rand stayed in. Yeah. Um, and then there's a bunch of rumors. Are they, is it Dark Friends? Fades? Nobody really knows because no one believes. I have... The Aes Sedai's eyes seem to share the people's hurt, to empathize with their confusion, and tongues loosened. She's down off Baldeven talking to the townspeople, and the next sentence is, They still lied, though, most of them. Some denied there had been any trouble at all, nothing at all. 
Moraine mentioned burned buildings all around the square. Everything was fine, they insisted, staring past what they did not want to see. I thought that was weird. They're in denial because they don't believe in fades. Yeah. And they saw one walk through the courtyard yesterday. Right. And then burn some buildings down. So they're they're just in denial. They're absolutely like nothing nothing to see here. Nothing happened here. You know, because they can't they don't have an explanation and they're totally in denial about what happened. Must be. Cuz they they're not like they're aware of what's going on. They're deliberately not looking at those buildings. You know, this is from Nynaeve's perspective. I don't think anyone is directly lying. We see like a a couple of people talk to Moraine. We see the dialogue and people just seem to be like making up likely stories. Like the first one is like, oh, it must have been an overturned lamp and it caught a few houses on fire. Like it happens now and then. No big deal. And everybody's sort of coming up with some likely story. And then they see that the boat had gotten away. That much was clear eventually from the others, cutting its mooring and fleeing down river only the day before while a mob poured onto the docks. I assume to chase after Doman, who was has been denounced as a dark friend. Right, because Gelb was up there saying, hey, dark friends. Yeah. And, yeah. and then you had this fade in the middle of the courtyard. and Causes a riot. She tried her opinion on Moraine, but some of the Emmons fielders may have fled on the boat. The I said I listened patiently, nodding, until she was done. Perhaps, Moraine said, then, but she sounded doubtful. An inn still stood in the square, the common room divided in two by a shoulder-high wall. Moraine paused as she stepped into the inn. This is the inn the boys were in. Feeling the air with her hand, she smiled at whatever she felt, but she would say nothing of it then. Nynaeve thought it would not be pleasant sleeping there. Even the air was heavy with fear. I just like that it keeps the narration keeps pointing out that Nynaeve can even Nynaeve can feel what's going on and she can only channel, you know, at best accidentally. I think it's also just the affect of the people around them are very. Yeah, I'm sure that doesn't help. Also, the creepy skinny innkeeper. We know about them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Never trust a skinny innkeeper. Never. In this entire series. Only I trust the fat ones. think that sometimes. If I like walk into a restaurant and see the owner and it's a skinny person, I'm like a little... <laughs> mm, where's your gut? Come on. with you? <laughs> the whole thing with the boat, I think they're able to put together from the rumors that every the boys probably fled on foot. My only question is, where is Tom right now? Yeah, that don't know. It doesn't say... He's He was wounded, and he said he was in the village for a couple of weeks. Well, he arrives in Camelin right after the boys, right? No. He goes down to um, Ilian, I think. Does he? They don't run into him at the inn? The no, no, no. He's not Queen's in this book. Blessing? No. God, when does that happen? Basil Gill is the um, the innkeeper there, and he helps Rand out. Who's pleasantly plump. Pleasantly plump, yes. You see the pattern, guys? He doesn't quite <laughs> fit into his old armor when he goes to serve Queen. Oh, uh, yeah. The Queen, yeah. Popping the steel rings off. Yep, it. totally. <laughs> Taunt doesn't come back until, because they go to Whitebridge, and then from there they get the message that they have to go to the Eye of the World, and they do that, and then they go back to Faldara, and they're there for a while, and then it's not until uh, the Hunt for the Horn when Rand's traveling... Yeah, when when do they run into him again? Oh, what a big baby. <laughs> I know, he's just standing there, why not me? Play with me. <laughs> I don't know exactly when it is, but it's he's playing in an inn. Yeah, I can't remember how they run into him again now. But I thought it was in an inn. In Cam- I thought it was in Camelin, even. Is it in Camelin? No? It's not in Camelin. Jeez, I'm just, I need to just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm thinking that. Tom later ran into Rand in Kyrian. Oh, okay. Tom later ran into Rand in Kyrian when the young man was making his way to Falma. Soon afterwards, Tom's girlfriend and apprentice Dana was murdered by the king. And oh then, my gosh, I forgot that whole part. Yeah, and he kills the king and the whole thing. That's yeah. That's all in Kyrian. Definitely not in Camelin. Man, the more we talk about Tom going through this... Uh doing the podcast the more i think of him as an assassin as before i thought of him more as a politician 
but he does off people like pretty frequently. <laughs> yeah. If they, if they make too much trouble. Or, or he sets a situation up where they're killed, where the politics force somebody to die. Yeah. Or someone else does his dirty work for him. He does He's that a lot. The very best. Yeah. At this game. Tom Marilyn for president. <laughs> Anybody for president? <laughs> Anybody else for president? Seriously. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think I got myself under control. There's a little exchange. I was going to read. Um, a village militia walks into the inn. Lance spared him one glance and snorted. Militia. Useless. The soldier looked over, looked over the room. Letting his eyes come to rest on them, he hesitated, then took a deep breath before stomping over to Mandel in a rush. Who they were, what their business was in Whitebridge, and how long they intended to stay. We're leaving as soon as I finish my ale, Lance said. He took another slow swallow before looking up at the soldier. The light illumined good Queen Morgase. The red uniformed man opened his mouth, then took a good look at Lan's eyes and stepped back. It's a cute little exchange. Don't mess with Lan. No. Don't, like, just don't mess with him. He'll intimidate you while casually sipping a beer. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a good scene. Yeah, it really is. I enjoy seeing Lan be a badass. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's sort of, yeah. I don't really have anything to say about it. It's just Lan being badass. Um, I also noted that Moraine was able to tell that the boys were there because they were uh, scared out of their minds while they were there. That's interesting. A little um, bit of emotion. Yeah. She okay. says they were in this room, perhaps a day ago, no more than two, afraid, but they left alive. She said the trace would not have lasted without that strong emotion. Hmm. And then Eve asked which two, and Moraine's like, don't know, but I know where one of them is. Yeah. She says she's like, we're going to go, we're going to go after them because I don't know where these two went. Right. We have no way of knowing. We, we don't know we, which we direction about they ran. We at the in. end of the book, at yeah. last chapter, that like we just no way of knowing which way they went. They could have fled in any direction. Yeah. And they know where they're going to Camelin. So she's going to try and meet them there. After a little bit of dialogue with Nynaeve, in whatever direction they ran, eventually they'll remember Camelin, and it is there I will find them. So I wonder if she's just in pursuit of Perrin the whole time, or if she just heads straight down the road. Yeah, I think she looks for Perrin. I don't know where they are right now, but they should be not... Perrin took them like what what was it too far north? Yeah. To to actually hit Camelin. So if they're coming back down in like a general sort of arc, they're going to end up there way slower than or they would end up there much slower than uh, the rest of the group that's like already um in in Whitebridge. They're out in the wilderness somewhere still. Yeah, Perrin but they, but he Perrin and Green get to Whitebridge before Moraine, right? I don't think no. Oh no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, because yeah, in the up. next chapter, they're they they get to the steading. That's right. Parent and Aguin, that is. I wonder if Moraine can track them in the steading. I'm gonna say no, but I have nothing to back that up. It seems like it would get cut off. Yeah, that's a pretty. I mean, we know it's a powerful thing. Steading. He, oh yeah, we should even talk about Aguin, that in the next who's chapter. an untrained channeler. Yeah, we're about we're just about to talk yeah. about this, but even a queen who's an untrained channeler immediately feels something. I mean, even Perrin feels it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Everyone feels it when they walk in. That sense of peace that washes over them, losing something, gaining something. Yeah. Elias has a great quote about how. What does he say? It makes Aes Sedai itch. shake like a seven day drunk or something like. Uh, I something, think it's I itch like a seven day drunk. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, this is a pretty simple chapter. It's just a little bit of, of the three of them. It's short. Just shows what they're doing while everybody else is fleeing. I didn't actually note this, but uh, the last paragraph is, uh, the meal was finished in silence, and it was a silent three who rode through the gates and down the Camelot Road. Moraine's eyes searched the horizon to the northeast, which means they're... That's, that's yeah, that's why I don't understand. She says they're going after Perrin, but then they head right after Matt and Rand. Well, she, it, it's accidental. She doesn't know which direction they ran in. True. They're just heading down the same road. To, toward Camelin. Toward Camelin. And I guess if Perrin is, if Perrin and Aguin are north, but we know, we know she's tracking Perrin. Right. Who's north, north east of them. I'm just going to read that again. Yeah. Because, yeah, uh, the meal was finished in silence and it was, 
a silent three who rode through the gates and down the Camelin Road. Moraine's, Moraine's eyes searched the horizon to the northeast. Behind them, the smoke-stained town of Whitebridge cowered. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. She's Look, looking, looking at, right at him. Yeah. Well, you know, he's probably Because they've gone away, south, but... so he's north of them. Yeah. Because they went down the river. And then he and then he's traveled east. So they're roughly northeast of Camelin somewhere. Hmm? No. Perrin is? No, he's still west of Camelin. Oh. East oh. of them. Oh right, right, right. Yeah. But between it's Moraine and then to the east of that is Perrin, and then to the east of that is Camelin. Makes sense. And Moraine's pretty much on the same longitude as Cam- the the Camelin Road is pretty much a direct east west road. Oh yeah, from Whitebridge. Um, so they are basically behind Perrin east west. So they're going to travel due east to try and catch up with him, and then maybe turn north. She's looking in his general direction. Yeah. She knows where he is. But they all they're, they're basically all heading to the same place. They're anyway. all heading towards Camelin. Yeah, and that's the end of the chapter. Yeah. Super short one. Definitely. just say Trump would really like the white cloaks in this series. No, oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when when Perrin uh, is attacked by the white cloaks and he goes out and kills them, you know, I, I think I think Trump would be out there. There was aggression on both sides. <laughs> I'm so upset about the Charlottesville thing. It's just crazy now. Like, come on, you have to at least not like Nazis. It's like a baseline thing. <laughs> you cannot, you're not allowed to do it. We, I grew up on Indiana Jones movies. The Nazis were the guys you got to kill. Yeah. Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> they're the ones nobody feels bad about. Yeah. It sort of makes but, me think, like, maybe now that the World War II or the generation that fought in World War II is either very elderly or dead at this point, like, does, did everybody just forget? What happens when you let rightist nationalism get totally out of control? Well, don't worry. I've got this on recording for the future when uh, the government comes for us and I can turn you over by carefully editing it out. (laughs) You know, so I talking to my buddy about this the other day. He works in the State Department and he's like, does stuff with Russia, junk, and it's all this whatever bureaucratic garbage. But until I ask his opinion about this kind of thing, like asked him about the Russia stuff the other day and... I was like, what do you think, man? He was like, well, if you really look at what's happening, he's like, nothing has actually happened. Like, there's a lot of sensationalism around, like, interview, private interviews, around what what people speculating what may have happened. But, like, until something happens in court or, like, he's like, this is just, it's just people yelling. Yeah. There's, there's a few touchstones. There is the special counsel. There's the... Yeah, I mean the Gr- fact that yeah, anything grand jury, is happening like those, is a those big are things deal. that have happened. There has been legislation passed by Congress that is explicitly anti-Trump and anti-Russian. Like it's this not Nazi nothing. thing. Like, what's going to come of it? You know, like, yeah, is anything that, really going to happen? Other, no. Hopefully, some outrage, like you said. Yeah, but uh, what else? No, I don't see anything. You know, what, his approval level still hasn't quite taken the nosedive it needs to really spur the Republicans into action. Well, I mean, if he pisses off a few more, you know, they, they've only got, what, the Senate by, like, three votes or something like that. and um, Yeah, it's the House that's the problem. So, you know, if he repels a few of the more forward-thinking Republicans, he's just not going to be able to get anything done. Yeah. It's going to be... No, I think we've, we've reached the point where he is uh, a, basically a lame duck president. Yeah. I don't think he really has a chance of accomplishing... Anything significant in the you near can't term. can't treat your staff like shit like that and expect to get anything done. Right. You can't do anything by yourself. That's he doesn't, he doesn't even have staff. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, because he thinks he can rule by decree. He thinks he can decree things and that will make them happen. No, no, no. People have to do those yeah, things. Yeah, right. That's, that's what he doesn't understand. <laughs> There's, you have to, to make things happen. And that takes staff and effort and consensus. Well, hopefully a staff that doesn't hate you. Yeah. Bureaucrats have much more power than anyone would like to think. Uh -huh. and if they disagree with what's happening, they can just lose the email or... Mm -hmm. Drag their feet. Yeah, it's surprisingly easy. Might take an hour, might take a month. We'll call you when we're done. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how long have the bureaucrats been um, auditing his taxes, right? Is that happening? Oh, I mean, his, this is the, that's his excuse for not releasing his taxes, is that they, they're under, he won't release them until they were done being audited. At least that was his excuse during the election. But, like, he's audited every year, and it takes more than a year. So his taxes are pretty much always consistently being audited. It's crazy. It's like bizarro world. I keep using that analogy when mm -hmm. I'm talking about this with my customers at work st and stuff. I don't know if, well, this isn't going to go on the podcast, but do you remember the show Super Friends? Where it's no. like, like Batman and Superman, and I don't know. I think it was all the DC characters. Oh, okay. Or the Marvel? I, no, I think DC. Yeah, that's DC. Um that they all like sit at a round table and you know save the world every day and uh there's a bunch of episodes where they like go to bizarro or the like bizarro it's like an alternate mm. universe where like superman exists but he's evil so they have to like fight each other right right i feel like we're in bizarro world sure everything is wrong yeah I mean, that's <laughs> Superman's mean. Like Batman's selfish. <laughs> I really feel like I woke up in another world. Like it's really weird, especially this Nazi garbage. Yeah. God damn it, Barry! Stop here, messing God. with the timeline. <laughs> the Flash. I don't know, have you watched The Flash at all? The TV show? No, but I. No. I mean, I got the reference. Patrick just made his beer foam up all around everywhere. How did you do that? Uh, if you like put it down too fast, oh. it's really full. Of yeah. Paper towels are for like cleaning up vomit or um, basically something you want to be able to dispose, of, like have something between you and the paper and whatever it is, and then be able to throw that thing away and never have to clean it. <laughs> you have to crush a spider in your hand and yeah, throw it in the trash. Totally. Although I use a uh, toilet paper for that. I catch them in jars. Yeah. For a hundred bucks, I will go on a date with you. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or your favorite podcast client.